Good morning and welcome to Sudburn and Tunstall Baptist Church and to Sudburn Baptist Chapel, which is where I am at the moment. Thank you for joining with us for this special service. This time when we come to reflect on the heart of the message of the gospel. I've been watching the sky dramatization of the events that happened at Chernobyl in 1986, I think it was. And if the accounts on that TV series are to be believed, the people as they watched from a distance the power station being opened up spoke of both the beauty of what they saw and the horror. The beauty is the radiation flooded into the air, and the horror at what it caused. In a sense, what we're doing this morning is the other way round. As we look into the heart of the message of the gospel, there is a sense in which we should be gripped with horror that these things should happen. And yet, with the help of the Holy Spirit, my prayer is that we would see the crucifixion of Jesus as something of great beauty. Got some notices at the start of the service. Very brief this time. We are meeting together on Easter Sunday to remember the resurrection of Jesus, to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. We'll be doing that online. We'll be live streaming the service, but obviously we'll be here as well, all being well, God willing. And so if you'd like to join with us at half past ten, please let Matt know. We would love to have more people in the church here for the greatest day of the year as far as Christians are concerned. And even if you can't come to the service, we are allowed now to sing outside without face masks on in socially distanced groups on pieces of land owned by churches. And it just so happens, across to my right here, we have a car park. And so a few of us, hopefully many of us, will be meeting at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning to sing, to worship God together, to worship the risen Jesus before we come in to have our Easter morning service together. If you'd like to be part of that, please do come along. Let Matt know again, but we would love to see you there. You've maybe heard rumours about this season. You've seen mountains of Easter eggs, but you're questioning the reason. You're pretty sure these days off work have something to do with religion. But let me tell you the truth of the God who became his own introduction. This is the God of arms wide open, the God who came to us in person. He didn't remain a distant father in heaven, but he sent himself to us, fully God, fully human. This is the God of making love knowable, walking, talking, reach out and touchable, living life so surrendered that the normal is radical, showing us through Jesus that more is possible. This is the God who was hailed as a king. As he entered the city, crowds celebrated him. As they throw down their coats, adoration they sing. The same crowds who, days later, shout, crucify him. This is the God of arms wide open, seeking to restore the relationship that is broken, even though he knows the words that we've spoken can either breathe worship or death and rejection. This is the God who came all the way to us who died in our place, love nailed to a cross, bleeding and beaten, speaking words of forgiveness. The God who stayed and suffered below the sign, this is Jesus. This is the God who once and for all gave his life for us. No, really, Jesus died once and for all. He fully covered the cost. He came to find you and bring you home even when you were far off. He went through hell to bring you heaven so that nobody need be lost. This is the God of arms wide open, who rose from the grave, death's power now broken, who goes ahead so that to follow is our constant invitation. His arms still spread wide as he calls us by name into his advancing kingdom. This is Jesus, arms wide open. God made knowable love in person, alive and present today, a breath away from each person, with a come and meet me just as you are, as the open invitation. This is the God of arms wide open.
nations tremble at his voice. All creation rises to Let's pray together now. Teach us, Lord, its meaning, that cross uplifted high. If one the man of sorrows condemned to bleed and die, Lord, teach us what it cost you to make a sinner whole. And teach us, Saviour, teach us the value of a soul. Lord Jesus, our Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, that is our prayer this morning, that you would teach us, that you would help us to behold our God seated on the throne, the God who hung on a cross. Be with us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to read now from Mark's Gospel again. We've been letting Mark uncover the meaning of Easter to us over these last few weeks. And now we're coming to Mark chapter 15, and we're going to read the first 39 verses. They're well-known verses, but we need to read them, we need to think about them, we need to read them carefully and prayerfully. So Mark chapter 15, reading from verse 1. And this is what we read. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. So they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things, so again Pilate asked him, Aren't you going to answer? See how many things they're accusing you of. 
But Jesus still made no reply. And Pilate was amazed. Now it was the custom at the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release you, the king of the Jews, asked Pilate, knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews, Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why, what crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder. Crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that's the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So you, who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, he said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God.
question I want us to consider this morning is this. Given what we have just been reading and thinking about and being led through on the various videos and songs that we have listened to together, given all of that, is it worth following Jesus? That's a question I want us to reflect on now for a few minutes as we come to the end of our 
time together on Good Friday. So far in our journey of discovery over Easter, we've asked three, well, this is the third of three questions that we've asked. The first question was, what does following or serving Jesus look like? The second question was, how is it possible to follow to serve Jesus? This morning, is it worth following, serving Jesus? Why would anyone bother, given what happened to Jesus? That's an important question, isn't it? What is the point of following someone who is heading for disaster? I've given up taking an interest on what goes on down in Portman Road. I'm sorry if you're appalled at my lack of faith, but quite frankly, I have no faith. The world is depressing enough as it is. I don't need something else to drag my spirits low. Or if football's not your thing, why would someone buy shares in a company that is obviously going down the tubes? Why would you buy a house on a cliff top in an area that's subject to coastal erosion? Why would you support a team that can't win half its games, even in the third tier of British or English football? And why would you follow a man who promises eternal life, but then ends up hanging dead on a cross? And we have not really understood our reading this morning. If there's not a part of us which is thinking, that is awful, this is tragic, this is a terrible way to die. I've been in tears this week as I've read and reread this account and reflected on these words again. Read them out loud, heard the account coming at me from different, um, different ways. As I've imagined the scene, this is horrific. And so my question is why would you follow someone like this? Where follow means to share a journey with them, but a few steps behind. I want us to spend a few minutes now just thinking about Mark chapter 15, unpacking a bit more of what was going on the day that Jesus died. There is far too much to do justice. Even if I've just read that through, I've been thinking, oh, I haven't mentioned that, and I should mention this, but we don't have time to go through it in great detail. I just want to pull out a few key points for us this morning. You may have noticed there are distinct similarities between the way Mark 15 starts and what we saw in Mark 14 nearly two weeks ago. Two days earlier in Mark 14, the first people we meet in the chapter are the religious leaders, and they are plotting to have Jesus arrested and killed. But at that time, they're scared of the crowds who love Jesus, or so they seem to. Now, Fast forward two days to Mark chapter 15. It's the religious leaders again who are the first people we meet. They are still plotting the death of Jesus. But they've made more progress than they ever dreamed possible. With the help of Judas, Jesus is now in custody. The crowd are now on their side, not supporting Jesus. And they're moving in for the kill. It looked for all the world like they, the religious leaders, were on the right side because they seemed to be winning. But I think there are at least three things, three things that I want us to notice this morning that show us that those religious leaders were on the wrong side. And actually, it makes perfect sense to follow Jesus, to serve Jesus. Three things that I want us to notice. The first is this. Jesus' confession shows us his identity. Jesus' testimony in these courts that we have seen him in, one in particular, there's another court at the end of Mark 14, show us who Jesus is. Listen to verse 2 of Mark 15. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. Or, it is as you say, Jesus replied. It is so significant that Mark starts this last and this greatest chapter of his gospel 
with a statement about who Jesus is. That has been a big theme all the way through Mark's Gospel. You see, Mark is all about who Jesus is. Time and time again, Mark records that very question, who is Jesus? And then he provides answers. Right back at the beginning of his Gospel in chapter 1, verse 1, Mark starts by writing these words, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus? The Son of God. And then all the way through, Mark is recording people asking the question, who is Jesus, or people giving the answer. Verse 23 of chapter 1, Jesus is in the process of casting out a demon. And this is what we read. Just then a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. And Mark writes that down because that's important. Then the demon says, you are the Holy One of God. So even the powers of darkness have identified Jesus. The disciples in chapter 4, in the calming of the storm, they've just seen this massive storm go completely flat. And then they're terrified, it says in verse 41, and they ask each other, who is this? Mark's big question. Even the winds and the waves obey him. And of course, if you look in the Old Testament, who is it that commands the winds and the waves? It's God. Jesus is God. Then we've got the establishment wading in in Mark 11, after the Palm Sunday account. And they come to Jesus, the religious leaders, and they say, by what authority are you doing these things? After Jesus has um, been saying some pretty strong stuff. and They come to him and they say, who are you? That's the big question. Now as Mark's gospel comes to a conclusion, he's underlining the identity of Jesus. Jesus appears in two courts. There's the Jewish court, then the Roman court. And the only time Mark records Jesus speaking is to confirm his identity. In the Jewish court at the end of chapter 14, the high priest asked Jesus, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. That's all he says there. And then, in our verse this morning, in verse 2 of chapter 15, Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus said. You see, as far as Jesus is concerned, and Mark is picking this up in his gospel, everything he is about to do hinges on his identity. And that is so important for us to grasp. A few verses earlier, we see Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane looking very human, pleading in prayer that he might avoid the cross, under so much stress that he couldn't stand the physical pressure. It was almost killing him. That was Jesus, seen in his humanity. But now as he fa faces the massed ranks of enemies that are circling him, the only thing that he says to them, as they bring their raft of ridiculous charges against him, is, I am the Christ. I am the King of the Jews. Jesus is a man, yes, but he is also God. The Christ, the Messiah. That is Mark's big claim. And that is what we have to remember as we go through this chapter. And when we come to the end of our reading, we see Mark underlining it again, don't we? As the centurion stands at the cross and he looks at Jesus hanging there dead and he says, surely this is the Son of God. If that's not true, if Mark is wrong, if Jesus was wrong, the whole of Mark's book falls down. Because it's all about the identity of Jesus. In fact, the whole of the Bible can be discarded. We can throw the Bible away if Jesus isn't God. There's no point at all in following Jesus if he was actually lying when he said, I am God. But of course, the last 2,000 years have shown that this book, the Bible, is not built on a lie. It has explained the world in a way that nothing else can. And it has transformed the world in a way that is simply miraculous, but which often we are so oblivious to. 
The Bible wouldn't work if Jesus isn't God, but it does work. And it can be believed. And it tells us that Jesus is God. And it all hinges on the identity of Jesus. If Jesus is God, then he is worth following. No matter if he goes places that sometimes confuse us or concern us. If Jesus is God, he is worth following because he deserves it. And he can be trusted even when unsettling things happen. Like death. And in this case, the crucifixion. Jesus' confession then shows us his identity. We must move on. But what about Jesus' guilt? Should we follow someone who is bad? Jesus is convicted by two courts and sentenced to death as a traitor. Doesn't that raise questions about whether we should follow Jesus? Isn't he a really bad example? But here's the thing. Jesus was not guilty, not in the slightest, And we see that in his trial. This is the second point. Jesus' trial shows us his innocence. Innocence is a very rare commodity, isn't it? What is our thought when we see a blue flashing light coming up behind us? Is it me? Are they after me? I haven't checked my tyres for a few weeks. We're worried about what they might find if they stop us. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the famous writer, the creator of Sherlock Holmes, is said once wrote a letter to 12 influential people in London, and the letter very simply said, flee, all is revealed. And then in this story, the next day, six of them had left the country because they felt they had some dark secrets that had been exposed. Guilt is so common. That's why we should be so slow to condemn others, because we're all failures in some respect. But here's the strange thing about Jesus' trial. The obvious conclusion from Jesus' trials is that Jesus is innocent. That might strike you as a a little bit odd. The two court hearings take place and Jesus ends up hanging on a cross. But it's quite obvious the court hearings do not match the sentence. Mark 1, sorry, 15 verse 1 says, Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin reached a decision. Aha, they reached their verdict. No, they didn't. They'd reached that verdict many months before. Their verdict was, whatever happens, Jesus must die. Five days before, we read um, in, uh, after the Palm Sunday account, the t- chief priests and the teachers of the law began looking for ways to kill Jesus. So they've decided their verdict long before any evidence is brought into play. The chief priests in Mark 14 at the end of that chapter are just trying to justify their decision. But they've got nothing, nothing worthy of any guilty verdict, let alone death. But the decision was made anything. The only thing to come out of that court was that Jesus claimed to be the Christ. And they had no evidence that that was not true. The whole of the case against Jesus was aimed at disproving that claim. And that should have been fairly easy. If the leaders could have produced one scrap of evidence against Jesus, confirming any sin that he had committed, the claim to be the Christ, the Son of God, would have been completely blown out of the water. And Jesus would have been guilty of blasphemy. If the Jewish leaders had managed to find one thing against Jesus, they wouldn't need to kill Jesus. They could just publish the evidence, the proof, and Jesus would be finished. The smallest sin in one who claimed to be the Son of God would have rubbished that claim. You could have argued that it would be preferable to prove Jesus guilty and then allow him to go free. With his claim to be Messiah gone, he would be nothing. And yet, as try as they might, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin, the whole raft of Jewish leaders could find nothing to pin on Jesus. Similarly, in Pontius Pilate's courtroom, the chief priests come and they accuse Jesus of many things. Pilate says to Jesus, aren't you going to answer them? See how many things they're accusing you of. 
But Jesus makes no reply, and Pilate is amazed because it's blindingly obvious that Jesus is innocent. Jesus, and yet, remains silent in the face of these ludicrous allegations. Pilate is aware that the Jewish expectation is that he will crucify Jesus, and he expects at least some denials and protestations of innocence from Jesus. But Jesus stands in silence, other than to confirm his identity. He doesn't have to say anything because the accusations are so ridiculous. Pilate sums all this up when he appeals to the crowds that are demanding crucifixion. Verse 14, why, Pilate says, why should I crucify him? What crime has he committed? It's a pressing question, but the crowd's minds are made up. We can't tell you any crimes, is the silent answer, but crucify him anyway, they scream. Jesus makes his court appearances, and nothing is found worthy of any punishment, let alone death. Why should we follow Jesus? He is totally innocent. Not just not guilty, but totally exemplary. With Jesus, there was absolutely nothing found that indicated the most minor wrongdoing. And yet, he still suffers. And it is in his suffering that we see the biggest reason to follow Jesus, to serve Jesus. And with this we close. Jesus' suffering shows us his love. Jesus' confession shows us his identity. His trial shows us his innocence. His suffering shows us his love. For the remainder of our time, I want us to focus on Jesus' suffering. The injustice of the trial was a key part of Jesus' suffering, but there is so much more. Jesus was exhausted In our reading, it's Friday morning. He's been up since Thursday morning. He's had one hell of a night, and I use my words carefully. He nearly died in the Garden of Gethsemane as he contemplated the cross, as he felt the weight of sin for the first time bearing down on his body, and as he saw the wrath of God in his path. That was suffering. He saw Judas betray him. That was horrible to go through. He saw his disciples run away. He was abused and insulted and condemned by the Jewish leaders. The temple guards blindfolded him, punched him, spat on him and beat him. He was then taken to Pontius Pilate for more of the same, ridicule and scorn. Then there was the horrors of Roman flogging, preparation for crucifixion. Many never made it to the cross because that was so harsh. Jesus' physical suffering was huge. But interestingly, Mark doesn't underline that. He talks about that, but he talks more about the mocking and the ridicule as being significant. The purple robe and the crown of thorns. The hail king of the Jews. Beating him on the head with a staff. Falling on their knees and paying homage to him. The Roman soldiers could have inflicted pain in a business-like way. But they want to do more than hurt. They want to humiliate. They want to destroy. Mark sums this up in verse 20. He doesn't say when they had hurt him, when they had wounded him, when they had injured him, when they had mocked him, is how Mark concludes. And then they take him to the cross. Jesus stumbles through Jerusalem to the cross, too weak to carry his own cross. And verse 24 sums up the final or rather the physical side of crucifixion in four words, and they crucified him. Some people say that when Mark describes crucifixion in that way, that he's diverting us away from the physical side of crucifixion, that we shouldn't dwell on it. I think I disagree. People knew what crucifixion was like. So Mark didn't need to go into details. It was a common sight to see the worst criminals strung up as a warning to anybody who would defy the might of Rome. Crucifixion was brutal. It was horrible. The worst form of death possible at that time. Slow, agonizing, torturous. 
But for Jesus, it was worse. He didn't deserve it. He was innocent. And Jesus was so alone. We see that as we go through with the crowds turning against him, the religious leaders turning against him, Judas turning against him, his disciples running away. And then ultimately at noon, God turning against him as the sky goes black and Jesus cries out with a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you of all people turned away from me? No one suffered like Jesus. Why would you follow somebody who went through that? Why would you follow somebody along that path, that sort of path of pain? Because that is what following Jesus means. There is suffering in following Jesus. The reason is very simple. And for many of us, this is not new at all. But we must remember it and keep it in our minds. Listen to how Peter describes it many years later in 1 Peter chapter 2. Peter says to his followers, to, not his followers, they aren't following Peter, but to his church, those who are looking to him for Christian leadership, to you, this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, he was innocent. No deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. That's why Jesus suffered. That's why it makes absolute sense to follow Jesus, because he suffered for us. We sing sometimes, it was my sin that held him there. He went to the cross so that I should never have to go through that level of suffering. He went to the cross so that you don't have to go through that level of suffering. That was what we deserved, and Jesus took it. Yes, we will suffer as Christians. That is a promise. Peter says, Jesus is an example to us. We will suffer, but never in the way that Jesus suffered. I heard someone say something pretty horrific recently. I'm sure it was a slip of the tongue. I can't remember who it was that said it. I'm sure it was no one here. But they said something like, we have to take up his cross. No, we don't. That's the whole point. We do not have to carry Jesus' cross. Because he has carried that for us. But we do have to take up our cross, which is very, very different. We will never have to go through the abandonment, the isolation, the suffering, the rejection by God. Because Jesus went there for us. Why should we follow Jesus? The Jesus who went to the cross? The Jesus who went through all of that? One, he is God. And he deserves our obedience. Two, he was totally innocent. He didn't deserve what he took. Three, because he went there for us so that we don't have to. He went there to bear our sin and the punishment that he deserves. He went there to set us free. Jesus' suffering shows us his infinite love for us. That's why it makes absolute sense to follow Jesus. In the words of Jesus at the Last Supper, in the words that we were thinking about on Sunday morning, Jesus says, pointing to his death on the cross, this is for you. Here and
as love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. When the prince of life our ransom shed for us his precious blood, who his love will not remember, who can cease to sing his praise, he will never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal day. Fountains open deep and wide Through the floodgates of God's mercy Flow a vast and gracious tide Grace and love like mighty rivers Poured incessant from above And tempts peace and perfect justice the guilty world's love. Let me all your love accepting, love you ever all my days. Let me seek your kingdom only, and my life be to your praise. You shall be my glory nothing in this world I see you have cleansed and sanctified me you yourself have set me free Let's pray together as we close. Our Father in heaven, as we look at the cross, we do recoil. We are horrified at what Jesus went through. The innocent, spotless Son of God dying the death of the worst criminal. It does horrify us, but it does show us your love for us. And for that we are grateful, deeply grateful. We pray that you would help us to follow Jesus, the one who died for us, and the one who has assured us of glory. Help us to follow him with every ounce of our being. This week we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.